Thank you, Honourable Speaker, for the opportunity to address the House today. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the lands of the Lekongan people, particularly the Songhees and the Esquimalt, and I am grateful for the opportunity to work and learn here. When I am in my own riding of North Vancouver Seymour, I am in the territory of the other Coast Salish people, of other Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish, from whom I am fortunate to learn about the past, their present, and our shared future. As a woman, the decisions you make about your own body should be yours. Yet, all over the world, many are persecuted for making their own choices, and many more are prevented from many making any choices at all. Regimes are trying to dictate who women can kiss, who they should love, how they must dress, how women identify themselves, when they have children, and how many children they have. Sexual and reproductive rights mean you should be able to make your own decisions about your body and get accurate information about these issues, access sexual and reproductive health services, including contraception, choose if, when, and who to marry, decide if you want to have children, and how many. They also mean that lives should be free from all forms of sexual violence, including rape, genital mutilation, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, and forced sterilization. So let's talk about supporting repro reproductive rights here in British Columbia. In my primary and secondary school years, reproductive health was not a topic of any classes, unless you counted sex education, that essentially warned everyone to remain celibate, however, not managing to tell us what that meant nor what the alternatives were. Never mentioned were such things as sexual abuse by a family member or friend, mechanisms to prevent pregnancy, or what to do if you got pregnant, nor was there discussion of how to tell your family or if your family would support you. As a result, there were many instances where teenagers became pregnant with no control over the outcome of their pregnancy, no option of abortion, or whether to take the fetus to term, or how or sometimes where to live, how to gain financial and emotional support. As you can imagine, these circumstances did, can, and did have profound impacts on the lives of young women. I remember hearing about camp babies, usually born in April or May, that were a result of summer, summer camps for cadets or for guiding and scouting. My girlfriend, assigned to a cadet camp as a military policewoman, ended up teaching reproductive education and contraception methods as a regular part of the training syllabus. She took this on as, as the statistics of post-camp pregnancy were consistent at about 7 to 10 percent each year, and she found that the teenagers, boys and girls, often had very little accurate information about how to protect themselves and to make thoughtful real relationship decisions. In my mother's time, adult women were expected to marry, have kids, stay at home to care for the kids, and not have a career. When I joined the military in 1979, my female departmental chief was the first woman in Canada in the Navy Reserves to stay in the Reserves after she became pregnant. Up until then, you were expected to resign from your role once you were having kids. Another st set of statistics that was evident was the number of teenage pregnancies associated right after graduation, particularly in all-girls schools. Again, these are events that have the, can have the effect of completely changing the trajectory of the lives of the girls, their offspring, and their families. There were also those who did not finish high school because they became pregnant. Fast forward to today where families are urged to support their kids to learn about and understand their rights to decide about their own bodies. Where schools and organizations offer information about reproductive rights and options, contraception, abortion, morning after pills. Where other organizations help women deal with unexpected, unwanted or traumatic pregnancies where consent is a word that gets explained in a variety of ways, including an analogy about a cup of tea, where bystander training is done in organizations to increase the possibility of others stepping in to avert circumstances of inappropriate sexual, violent, racial, or harmful behavior, where some high schools have childcare facilities on site so that young moms can complete their studies, where an abortion is available for a variety of reasons, mental or physical health, fetal health, accidental pregnancy, to name a few. And this year, through providing through free contraception in British Columbia, reproductive and sexual rights have become much more accessible to all BC residents. Now, in a time that is financially challenging, anyone can access over 60 
different contraceptive measures of various kinds, oral or, or injectable medication, interuterine devices, vaginal rings, and morning after pills. This coverage is through BC Pharmacare's uh, BC Pharmacare plan, no cost, universal, full coverage. And Br British Columbia is the first and only province in Canada providing universal free contraceptives to all residents. Since the province implemented a universal coverage plan for contraceptives, making them free for residents in BC, over 178,000 people have received free contraceptives and saved on costs. Approximately 136,000 of these are in the age group of 20 to 39. The number of people receiving contraceptive dispensing has increased by about 2,500 per month, with an average savings per person of at least $125 over a year, depending on what you were using. A person still needs to get a prescription from a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a sexual health clinic, or through virtual health. However, no amount is due when picking up that prescription. Of particular importance is the impact in, on youth. In BC, youth under the age of 19 are legally able to consent to health care, including preventative health care on their own behalf, as long as the health care provider, for instance, the physician or nurse practitioner, has explained to the youth and is satisfied that the youth understands the nature and consequences and the reasonably foreseeable benefits and risks of the health care. And the health care provider has made reasonable efforts to determine and has concluded that the health care is in the youth's best interests. If these conditions are satisfied, a youth is able to get a prescription and fill it without having to have parental consent. This continues to be the case for pre prescription contraceptives. Parents or guardians will not be notified that their child has obtained contraceptives per the laws already in place. Parents or guardians are not able to access PharmaNet dispensing records on behalf of youth over 12 Thank unless you, the member. youth consents in writing or is incapable of giving consent. Thank you. Thank you, Member.